So, uh, container device interface. So for those that are fans of Sarus, uh, this is going to be something like close your heart. So basically, uh, there was, well, we all know, and, and from uh, Vanessa's presentation, we have a plethora of container runtimes. And at some point, we realized as a community that we were doing the same thing in different ways, right? So as, as, as a joke always in, in science, we sit down and set another standard. But the good thing about this standard is that it's uh, now the official one because it's part of the OCI standard. So it's like it's the official way for the o open container initiative of injecting devices into a container, right? So as I'm saying, so it's a CNCF sponsored standard. So it's not just yet another standard proposed by a random person. And uh, CDI is, stands for like con uh, container device interface. And basically, as I was saying, like for for those that know Sarus is a way, and as, as CJ was saying, CDI is now the de facto way on how hardware providers and, uh, and drivers tell the container what, what's needed to utilize a driver. Or uh, like rounding it up is a device, right? And even this could be utilized not just for, for hardware, but even for like uh, MPI, you can have like a CDI implementations to inject the proper MPI uh, libraries into a container. So as of some months ago, we also enabled CDI for Singularity uh, disclaimer, Singularity Scilabs. Uh, I don't know, I'm not aware if Abtainer has forked and uh, worked on this. I know that the code was merged into the Singularity Scilabs, but I, as, I, I didn't track it, like if it went down to Abtainer or not. It has been uh, merged into, into Podman, Cryo, Container D, and Docker. So basically, all of the container runtimes that are uh, CNCF sponsor and that uh, try to address to the OCI community standards. Uh, I think for Singularity, as it says here, it only works in uh, OCI mode, which I think is uh, also translated to namespace mode in Singularity. And how does this look, right? So this is why I said like it's very similar to how uh, Sarus implement, implements the OCI hooks to then uh, like be better at MPI and be better at, at hardware utilization. So CDI is produced by hardware vendors. So as you can see, like uh, up there in the corner, it says NVIDIA. So you can find like Intel or, or AMD or like, uh, so it's a responsibility from the vendor to pass to the container runtime on the how do you use me, right? So we, MB so this is an example from NVIDIA where we say like, hey, container runtime, uh, this is everything you need to uh, mount. These are, uh, all the arguments and if you need like environment variables. So you pass everything you know the container will need to the container runtime in this file and then internally the container runtime use this, injects it into the, into the JSON file of the OCI container uh, runtime spec and then your container gets access to your specific device, right? So that's kind of like a high level of what CDI is is uh, an implementation of how to tell any container runtime how to use uh, a hardware device. And like this is a very complicated way of like how uh, a, con a CDI or, or the current state of, of NVIDIA container stack looks like. So we have something that is called the NVIDIA Container Toolkit. And now the NVIDIA Container Toolkit has uh, automated ways of telling uh, Container D, Docker, Podman, uh, like, hey, this is the CDI spec for this specific GPU, right? And the good thing is that it is dynamic in saying that if you configure your GPU to use MIG, right? Like uh, you split your GPU using uh, MIG, then the container, uh, NVIDIA container toolkit is going to be aware of this and is going to modify the CDI implementation file and is going to then let know the, the container runtime, like, hey, uh, this GPU is working under, under MIG configuration so you can only uh, you can use uh, one, two, three, or four, like four GPUs from the slides, and and that that is all going to be passed on the CDI JSON file, right? So the contain uh, 
I want to move fast to get to questions. So the second thing that uh, CJ mentioned was DRA, right? But uh, first, I want to kind of like a stop so I can refresh uh, HPC heads. So what is DRA for the HPC ecosystem? So for those slurm, uh, uh, DRA, you can kind of like map it out in your head to what the slurm genetic resource is, so the grass. But uh, DRA, uh, as you will see, is uh, like a, a new implementation and it provides like fine grain control over the resources, just not to mention that it's better. But uh, GRES, as uh, you know, this is how uh, it's defined in a SLORM file. These are the, the what each flag means. And it basically, uh, when, when you're configuring a SLORM, you configure uh, GRES. And then when you're defining a job, you can uh, tell the SLORM, like, hey, I know, I might know that we have some GPUs with MPIs configured or with MIC configured. So please run there and please yeah, utilize the, the specific configurations for that. And SLORM will pass that to your uh, process, right? Not even a container, because SLORM can be container aware or not, depending on how you configure it. But then, uh, in the Kubernetes community, we wanted to do something similar, but we wanted to be uh, Kubernetes aware. So, as I see just while mentioning, this is something that is plugged to the kubelet. And uh, we kind of like stop calling it DRA kubelet plugin, we now call it DRA driver. Uh, because we want to do a mapping on like DRA is going to be what the driver is to a node level implementation when you are using like CUDA, for example. Now DRA is going to become the driver for your Kubernetes cluster, right? So it, it goes uh, to the concept of Kubernetes becoming the, the second layer of the kernel for distributed systems. So with DRA, we call it uh, DRA drivers. And then, as a driver, it's a responsibility from the vendor, so NVIDIA, Intel, AMD, uh, any hardware provider, is going to be responsible for producing and passing and handing to you the DRA driver for the specific uh, hardware piece that you have, right? So how does it work? Uh, we, the vendors, we pass the vendor parameters to Kubernetes as a resource claim parameters and as resources license. That gets communicated to the kubelet, and then the kubelet communicate that back to the scheduler. So once the kubelet, so the, the driver, communicates that to the kubelet, the kubelet communicates that to the API server, and then the API server uh, tells the scheduler, like, hey, we have some nodes that have these drivers. And the drivers then can, depending on how you conf uh, the type of DRA driver that you deploy, you could have GPU nodes with MIG, you can have GPU nodes with MPS, you can have GPU nodes with Intel, AMD, you name it. And then as, uh, when a user is requesting a job to the Kubernetes API server and the scheduler, the scheduler is going to be aware of where do you have the GPUs with MIG, where do you have the GPUs with MPS, where do you have GPU, and you can even, uh, I think I have, uh, have a JAML example, no. I try to be not so technical. But uh, in a JAML example, pardon for not having an example, uh, you can uh, specify a, a specific type of GPU, right? If you know that you have a heterogeneous cluster where you have like old GPUs and new GPUs, so in, in the job specification file, you can say like, oh no, only give me uh, Ampere GPUs or only give me Tesla GPUs or I, I'm going fancy and give me a Blackwell GPU. So you will be able to tell uh, what the name of the GPU in the in the job in, uh, specification, right? So that's the good thing about the driver is that the Kubernetes scheduler is going to be aware of all the capabilities of your node, right? Versus today, where uh, Kubernetes is doing it via the uh, what is called the device plugin, and we are not advertising uh, kind of like all the features of a GPU. We kind of like a struggle to communicate up to the Kubernetes scheduler all the capabilities from a node. Now with the array. We, uh, the driver is going to have a one-on-one -on -one communication with the scheduler, and if you reconfigure the, the, the driver to say uh, like MIG or not MIG, uh, the scheduler is going to like be aware of like, okay, I have uh, some MIG nodes now, or I, I lose the MIG nodes in real time. And uh, I think this is for the next section, what I have, the next slide. I have all, all, all my sections. Questions, and actually I have a question. Can you, can you leave it plugged in maybe? Because uh, 
you still use the toolkit as a hook, kind of, right? I mean, you to to discover and configure the GPU on the node, right? You had this in the YAML slide, I think. Yeah, so that's the responsibility of the con uh, NVIDIA Container Toolkit. Yeah. So the NVIDIA Container Toolkit communicates with the, uh, what's it called, like the NVIDIA SMI yeah. in the node, and then uh, depending on the type of GPU and how you configure it, your GPU, then it will auto-generate the, the CDI file and it hands it, hand it over to the runtime. Yeah, well that's only on the node then. Right. Yeah, that's when they know. So you advertise something to the API server, and so that the schedulers are yeah, aware so of everything. They are going to be partners, right? Like so, CDI and DRA. I want, I want to be like uh, one yeah. CDI next to each other. So CDI is going to be like, let's say, like here, yeah. and uh, then CDI is going to be working side by side with the DRA driver. Yeah. Because uh, the DRA driver is communicating up to the Kubernetes scheduler, but uh, as as CJ uh, pointed in one of his slides. Once the Kubernetes scheduler tells the kubelet to run a job, then that is a container level implementation, and then that's go, that goes back to the container toolkit. It's like we, we are doing like a, a vertical uh, implementation of a driver, so from the container runtime all the way to the Kubernetes scheduler. Yeah. So it's standardizing what everyone is do, has done anyways, right, with interacting with the toolkit and then figuring out what to yeah, pass to the are container. are automating everything and also providing fine-grained control to users. Yeah. All right. Questions? Yeah, that, like while people raise their hands, so this, in the future, not right now, but in the future it will enable possibilities like two uh, Kubernetes pods sharing a GPU or like uh, one Kubernetes pod having multiple GPUs, right? Like you, different use cases will be enabled by this. Back on the CDI, you um, you talked about what runtimes have implemented it. What about um, vendors that are creating support for their devices as well? And would this be applicable for like MPI support, or is it not really the right abstraction? It's it's not the right abstraction, okay. but uh, like the low level details of what CDI is is very, very similar to like what Saru does with yeah. uh, OCI hooks. Right? Yeah. Because what, it, what uh, CDI is basically doing is on the, on the pre-start of the container, it modifies the, the OCI runtime spec with extra things, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the same. Okay. Cool, thanks. CDI is like not necessarily Kubernetes related, right? It's like container runtime. Singularity, yeah. Podman. Just to, to point it out. Yeah, at the node, yeah, the node level when you uh, configure like, let's say Docker in C, because you have a Docker, you have to configure Docker in CDI mode. So you have to do some like two or three steps to tell Docker like, hey, now we're on CDI mode. Uh, then you can run Docker and say like, uh, Docker uh, devices and you can say all or you can, if you have multiple devices or you're running a MIG device, then you can say uh, one, two, three, or things like yeah. that. Yeah. And CDI is necessary to run DRA. So DRA is like communicating the information to the scheduler and making sure that the scheduler knows all of this, mm -hmm. but you need CDI for Yeah, it, it's like we're always building on top of uh, the standard. So uh, CDI has been going for a couple of years and now that is, is getting stable, that's why we have the, the the capabilities to propose this new thing that is the array, right? Yeah, yeah you kind of anticipated my, my question. I, want, I wanted to ask about the maturity of the CDI because I remember speaking with the main developer some time ago and he was saying, yeah, we're kind of breaking some part of the API on every minor release, so what, what, what's the outlook for 1.0 and stability eventually? Uh, I mean, I'm biased because part of, uh, like people in my team collaborate and they are on the CDI implementation and they contribute. Mm -hmm. And uh, like all of the products of my team and I, my team supports the GPU operator, so like the way to use G, uh, GPUs in Kubernetes, we are using CDI in production. So we think it's stable. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say that it's, it's mature enough. Yeah, it, it has been running for a couple of years now and uh, uh, we as a team feel that it's stable and it can be in production. And that's why uh, DRA is going to be building on top of CDI. Yeah, for, we as a team think it's stable. 
Yeah, I mean, like, we think it's stable. We trust what we have done. So, uh, yeah, uh, we, we propose it to be uh, in production, and I think it has been in production since this year. So everyone running the latest GP operator, uh, you can have seat. Well, if your low-level Kubernetes version uh, allows it, you are running CDI. So it works on my machine. Yes. <laughs> um, so the last two talks together sounded interesting to me, and I wasn't sure I totally understood, CJ, how we were hiding the NVMe from the NVMe drive from the uh, host. And it made me think that if we're going to do NVMe over Fabric or something like that, using something like CDI, like how would we know that the NV that, that NVMe drive, which I can get to over Fabric, would be available to this particular node at this particular time in order to do the APIs that CJ, uh, CJ was talking about? Or did I misunderstand how that was supposed to work? Yeah, uh, is that a Kubernetes question or like regular node level question? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you want to take it first? So yeah, at the Kubernetes level, the DRA driver, since it advertised to the to the API server and the scheduler. So when I say the API server, is that when you are uh, querying the node object of in Kubernetes, like when you do kubectl describe node, in in the object you are going to see that it has a GPU and and that it has devices like a, a, a NVMe. So it will be advertised there. Okay, so if it's hidden from the node, then it can't be available to CDI. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, at the Kubernetes level. Yeah. Uh, maybe CJ can respond without Kubernetes. But this is mostly, so it, it's not that it's hidden from <laughs> CDI. What I would say, like, refreshing my answer is more like it is hidden from the scheduler. So if you are, so if you are trying to run a job and you want your job to run on a node with that M MBME, so it's like the scheduler is, maybe if, if you are not advertising it, the scheduler is going to say, oh, I, I don't have where to run it, right? So that's why we need to advertise it uh, in the node object of the API server. So I'm not, uh, I'm not sure this is addressed as your question, but you can, as you configure the OS, you can make it see or not see whatever devices that are there. And so you can say these, if, suppose there are four drives in a node, you can say, okay, I'm going to let the OS see two of them. And the OS just has no idea that the other two even exist at all. And that's a manual, uh, that was sort of the step minus one, is that admin has to manually do that and say those drives are now sequestered. They're still available. And so they can be available, made available and exposed to some other demon that's there that can see them and access them. Is that the part that you were asking about? So now, now that the demon can see those, then it can take those and expose them as resources uh, to Kubernetes. So Kubernetes and Slurm today uh, don't have any standard machinery for managing drives which is why we create, we're looking to create a, a DRA driver um, instance for the drive resources. And uh, so you need both, in, in the case of SCADA, you need to be able to have access to the drive and to be able to manage that as a resource. But the thing that you're really re uh, managing is a domain socket to a server because the server owns those. And the server, so you can basically say, here's how many instances there are and you can expose those to the API server so that it knows how many there are and it knows that if something else is already using all of the available drives, then you can't schedule a job here. You could schedule it on a different node or you have to wait until there's one available. Uh, and so you can manage, you basically make an exposed resource. And Slurm also has mechanisms, generic mechanisms for dealing with you know, any kind of resource. You'd have to explain and expose, okay, this new kind of resource is a drive or is it domain, such a domain socket and be able to manage it that way. We haven't implemented that in Slurm, but it's, it's been done before, or that sort of thing's been done before. Does that address your question? Okay. Let me come. Okay, uh, just a very simple question. Uh, is it necessary any kind of privilege escalation in order to use 
dish interface. So to install the DRA driver? No, to use it on containers. No. I, I'm asking this because as far as I remember, and I may be mistaken, uh, but for Charles it was set to ID bit at some point in the executable. So just following the analogy, I'm asking this if you need any kind of, or it can run and full user namespace. At least at the Kubernetes, what I'm concerned, yes. Like the only part where you need privileges is to install the driver. <laughs> But once the driver is there and it's advertising the resources to Kubernetes, you can the, the what you can do there is uh, via RBAC control to to control the service accounts that can consume or not those resources. But okay, and maybe a follow-up question is uh, because I, I've seen that uh, the interface allows you to define mount points and uh, it allows you to insert uh, device files on the container, right? Is there any idea to uh, add scripts or maybe pieces of code in the same way that OCI hooks work today? You mean like uh, pre-run scripts? Yeah, something like that, in order to try to mount, partition, or use devices in a similar way. No, but that's, so as I was telling Christian, so the, the container runtime and using uh, like NVIDIA container toolkit, I think the toolkit would be kind of like doing the, the job of, uh, of the script that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And the logic of the toolkit is to communicate back to the, to the NVIDIA drivers on the host. It will check everything that is there and then it will communicate back to the container runtime and it will tell the container runtime like, hey, do this, this, and this. And then it's up to the container runtime to do it. So it's like uh, no scripts needed, right? At least for like, because uh, it's a driver. Maybe running scripts for other things like MPI, because I, I Alberto wants to uh, add answers here. Uh, but yeah, for, for this, no, no scripts needed. Okay, uh, so. But like, can you do it? Yes. Uh, are we doing it with a, like for NVIDIA stuff? No, because. No, no, I'm not, I'm not thinking on the specific case of NVIDIA GPUs, maybe another kind of. Yeah, but it's not device. the use case of CDI, because CDI is just to, pa to like, modify the OCI uh, container runtime spec hmm. with extra JSON things okay. to, to tell the runtime to mount them, right? So it's, it's the CDI only cares about the, the JSON, uh, the, op the OCI runtime spec. Right? Okay, then the runtime spec can execute hooks, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just a prelude to... Yeah, that's what I said, like the CDI is just to like, hey, you have these devices. Yeah, may, maybe I, I can add, like, my, my expectation is that the CDI will supersede hooks f as the way to mount hardware into containers, but we will still have to, res like, hooks will still be useful to do other software-related manipulations if you want to start other processes. Add, like, CDI, for example, do, does not, as far as I understand, does not provide logic for like the MPI replacement or libfabric replacement, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It, but it will be able to help you with loading the, the hardware. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's my expectation. Yeah, but as part of, uh, like here, as part of this, uh, that you are injecting via CDI, like maybe you can mount also like some libraries for MPI, things yeah. like that. Yeah, 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 but what I'm saying is that you're not able to have runtime logic in, in this, but you can, call, you can call hooks. So yeah. in, a, in, a, in a certain way, CDI is a higher, le is a higher level than, than hooks. Yeah, it makes the configuration easier, right? I mean, and, and in my opinion, like, it addresses uh, a long time uh, and an important deficiency of, of hooks is that like the CDI can actually set environment variables, and this is sorely needed uh, for OCI hooks. Yeah. 